So you may see a pop-up saying we are now recording. Welcome to our YouTube people checking in here. So my name is Jamie Vibach and I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. That means I handle everything going on here in Will County. And since there wasn't a whole lot going on when everything shut down, I started doing these webinar series. So uh, if you've missed any of our previous ones, they are all recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. So please feel free, share the links with friends and family. Um, so because this is a webinar format, everyone's muted, your camera's off. Um, you can see me, I cannot see you. So if you're joining me in your pajamas, I, you know, no judgment here. So uh, again, check out our YouTube channel for previous webinars, um, or if for some reason, you know, you lose us here, you have to sign out, you can finish it up on the YouTube channel. And I usually have them posted within a day, so check it out there. If you have a question during the webinar, please use the Q&A box. That lets everybody see your question. It also makes it easier for me to find them all. Uh, questions can sometimes get lost in chat, especially if there's a lot of comments in there. Um, but for your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat. So you can talk to me, I can talk to you, but you can't talk to each other. So another webinar feature that we have up there. So on the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it costs us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you're going to be taken to a page with a bunch of resources, uh, things you might be interested in, like our Bringing Nature Home brochure, um, our rain barrels, rain garden brochures, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but our virtual tip jar is also there. So please consider a donation or a donation as a membership. Um, that just helps to keep us running. So, um, and our members get access to a wide variety of members only stuff. So um, thank you for that. Those of you who have donated and contributed, it, it really does help to keep us going and helps me justify to my boss why we're gonna keep doing these. So. Um, so upcoming webinars, as I mentioned before, we are moving to a new day. So rather than doing them on Mondays and Thursdays, we're going to be doing them on Wednesdays now at one o'clock. Um, per the survey that we did, thanks to those of you who participated, one o'clock, I guess, still seems to be the best time. So um, Wednesday on August 5th, we're going to be doing Magnificent Monarchs. So I will get to share my enthusiasm and love and passion for monarch butterflies with everybody. We will have some special guests. I'm sure you can imagine who that might be. And, um, you know, we're just going to talk about everything from how you can bring them to your yard, raising them indoors, and that fantastic voyage they take down to Mexico every year. So lots of great stuff coming up on Wednesday. Hope you can join us for that. All right, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here with you, and we can get started. All right, there we go. There we go. All right, so what's blooming now? That is my contact information there. If you have any questions that we aren't able to get to or stuff that you think of later, please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, that is my desk phone number there. I'm working from home. I do get my voicemails via email. Isn't technology great? Um, but the easiest way to get a hold of me is always via email. So um, again, if you have any questions, comments, come up with topic ideas that you want to send me, um, please, by all means, drop me an email. So the Conservation Foundation, this is our mission statement here. Uh, and our, our focus is to help to improve the health of our communities. So our little tagline is we save land, we save water. And the reason we do that is for human health as well as environmental health as well, because it just all plays in together. So a healthy environment means healthy people. So, um, and we are an accredited land trust, which is really a very cool thing. Uh, it's a national organization that took a look at our records and everything that we're doing and says, yep, we're doing it right financially, ethically, um, you know, our leadership is great and everything that we're doing, we're doing it the right way. So get outside. That's the, really the best advice I can give to anybody, it, especially during, as, as everyone likes to say, these uncertain times, getting outside is, has proven to be a big stress reliever. Study after study, I, you know, it's something that we, those of us who spend time outside know 
instinctively that we feel better when we get outside, but studies are starting to show that that's the case as well. So the more time we spend outside, the lower our stress hormones are, the more relaxed we feel, and you know, exercising outside is more beneficial than exercising inside. Just, it's really weird. Our bodies just respond like that. This photo was taken at one of our camps last year. All the kids laying down, pretending to be roots. I mean, ah, just so cool. You know, kids love being outside and getting kids outside is really important too. Good for their mental health, their physical health. It's just good. So get outside. And today we're going to talk about what are we going to see if we go outside right now? What's blooming? Well, summer on the prairie is, is probably the best. It's, it's really when the prairie looks its best because there are so many things blooming right now. Um, I've got a list of things that we're going to talk about. I'm going to share some of my favorite plants with you that are blooming right now, but just know that this is just a short list. There are tons and tons of things I'm not even going to get to. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the more common things you might see if you were to go out, say, into a forest preserve right now, or if you have native plants in your yard. Um, you know, if you have these, this is what, what's blooming. Anytime we talk about planting plants in your yard, planting natives, um, you really want to look at making sure you have things that bloom all year long. And so that was another thought I had in my head when I was putting together this particular repeated webinar was, let's take a look over time and see how things change. And to give you ideas on when you're planting in your yard, make sure you have some of each of these so that you've got things blooming all year long. A, because it's pretty and hey, we want our yards to be pretty, but also because for the pollinators that depend on the flowers, having things that bloom all throughout the growing season is really important to them. So having things that bloom in the early spring for those first pollinators that get here and those first ones that emerge early and having things then that bloom late into the fall as the monarchs are migrating through and all that kind of stuff. So we wanna have those thoughts in our head as we're designing our gardens for many, many reasons. So let's take a look at some of my favorite plants that are blooming right now. So no garden is complete, in my humble opinion, without a little milkweed. So there are seven species of milkweed. I've heard as many as 30 something, but really seven main species. For the garden, there's really three. So common milkweed is the one that you're gonna see grown on the roadsides and the forest preserves. Be careful putting this one in your yard only because it spreads. If you have room for it to take over a large patch, by all means, but know that it's gonna get six or seven feet tall if it's happy and it's going to spread. It spreads by rhizomes, those underground roots that just sort of like spread out and then new plants pop up. Um, but also it's a very prolific seed producer. So I planted one in my rain garden. I now have 14, like three years later. So know that it is very prolific, it's very large. You want it in an area where it can get big and not look super out of place. Now there are ways of keeping it more under control if it's in your garden, such as cutting it by a third in June. That'll make it not grow quite so tall and a little bit bushier, but anyway. So this is one that you're gonna see blooming. Um, it, it's getting towards the end of the bloom and the seed pods are starting to form. But if you can find one that's still in flower, smell it that little cluster of flowers is like the most beautiful perfumey smell ever. I love it. So really stop and smell the flowers on that one because it's fantastic. Butterfly milkweed or butterfly weed is another member of the milkweed family. Um, it's got those bright orange flowers on it. Very, very striking when you see it in somebody's garden. I actually took this picture in my dad's yard. He planted this one. Normally, I, I, I say they grow up to about knee high, but if they're really happy, they can get more between like knee and hip high. So, um, you know, but this is a great, much more controlled type of milkweed if you're going to plant it in your yard. Um, not so much, you don't see this one so much out in the wild uh, as you do common, but it's a great native, monarchs love it. It's great for other pollinators too, and it looks really pretty. 
swamp milkweed sort of falls in between height wise butterfly weed and common um, i usually say that one gets to be more about waist high um, but you know it can get bigger or shorter depending on how happy it is but it's got a really pretty striking um, purple flowers on it like that so um, another one lots and lots of pollinators love it another one that monarchs will lay their eggs on so really great plant to have out in your yard all right the cone flowers so there's several different types of cone flowers and and I included the scientific binomials on these just because if, if you're trying to learn your plants it's a good idea to learn the scientific names as well um, the common names can vary from region to region and sometimes the same common name is used to describe three you know three or four different plants depending on where you are so knowing the common or the um the binomial the scientific name for them can be kind of important if that's what you're looking to do if you're you know just a casual observer it's fine to know okay that's pale purple cone flower instead of echinacea pallida but it also helps you to understand the families and how the families interrelate. So even though I included gray-headed coneflower in there because the common name is a coneflower, you'll notice it's a completely different genus than the other two. So they kind of look the same, but they're actually not that closely related. So um, pale purple coneflower and purple coneflower have the same genus. They are closely related, um, but you can see kind of some of the differences between them. Um, pale purple coneflower, those petals really droop a lot more than purple coneflower that are not quite so droopy. Um, but insects love these. So bees, butterflies. Um, I was at the uh, garden that we put in, a pollinator garden we put in down in Morris yesterday, and the purple coneflowers were fully in bloom and butterflies and, and um, you know, little bumbly bees and everybody was enjoying them so very very good pollinator plant there so um, Greg wants to know do coneflowers propagate by seeds yes they do um, these I hesitate to say this I, I'm fairly certain I read that they are um, kind of an annual but they reseed themselves so prolifically they just come up year after year so they kind of behave as a perennial even though that individual only lasts for one year so uh, just something to keep in mind there too if you're if you're planting them so um sandy if my picture is there you can actually move where my picture is on there um you can just kind of grab it and pull it up if you can't see it that's not something unfortunately that i can control on your screen all right moving right along our next ones that are blooming are the rubecchias black-eyed susan and brown-eyed susan a lot of folks aren't aware that there are actually two different species but they are different um, even though they're both rubecchias um, the black-eyed susan super common i i always consider this along with coneflower to be one of the um uh, like a starter native so people who are just getting into native plants who aren't that familiar with them like they're cool putting these in like this is a familiar thing so um, a lot of people will put these in um, just as one of the first things that they get to um, but brown-eyed Susans they're a little bit taller than the black-eyed Susans uh, and and they're more branching so you'll see rather than just one stem up there with the leaves and the flower on it you'll see lots of like branching in and amongst them so um, but both of these are great pollinator plants and both of them are blooming now all right liatris is the next one let me just kind of check here we go um, Good way to save the seeds greg wants to note yeah for any of the natives if, if you're looking to save the seeds wait until they're mature they start to look like they're um like the they're they're dying and they're getting kind of dried up and you can really just clip the seed head into a bag and that'll help then when you're ready to plant them 
then you know it depends on the plant whether it's got to be planted in the the fall or the spring or how how you do it there's a lot of different propagation things and that really goes beyond the scope of this webinar today um, but one interesting thing i forgot to mention let me go back um, let's see if i can there we go um, actually I'm gonna go back to here. Um, this gray-headed coneflower, by the way, the, those seed heads, when you crush them, they, they crush in a very, a very satisfying way because they just sort of crumble it when you pinch them. Um, but they smell like anise as well. So um, if you like that black licorice kind of smell, it's, it's a pretty pungent thing. But um, those are really easy to just walk by right into a bag and just kind of squeeze them and get your seeds that way. All right. So moving right along, Liatris, Blazing Stars. These are awesome. These are another one that get a little bit tall. You can see how that flower head just sort of goes right up through the middle of everything. Um, they're great to plant in clumps of other plants because they all sort of support each other and help everybody to stay upright. When you're that tall, you get a little top heavy and run the risk of flopping over. Um, if you have them planted by themselves, a really interesting um, thing that I saw recently, somebody used like tomato cages to help them, you know, put the tomato cages over the top of them to help support them. So um, that helps to keep them upright in there. But um, there are actually more species of Liatris than just these three that I have here. Um, but all three of these are, are really nice and boy, butterflies just love them. Those flowers are, are really great attractants for butterflies and bees and uh, lots of other great pollinators. So um, Liatra scariosa, the savanna blazing star is the one I, I think we see most often um, in the horticultural trade, but you know, marsh blazing star, rough blazing star, also really, really great plants. I, I have these in my yard this year and they are blooming like crazy. I definitely need to remember the tomato cage trick though for next year because I forgot to put them on there this year and they're sort of flopping over now. And that bright red one. I grouped these two together, even though they're unrelated, because they're, I, I, for whatever reason, I cannot keep the two of these straight. So for this webinar, I was doing my research. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna figure out how to tell these two apart. Well, one of the ways to tell them apart is cardinal flower likes it where it's wet and royal catch fly likes it where it's dry. So, um, cardinal flower can be a little hard to grow, I've heard, um, but if it gets into a spot that it's really happy, it will come back year after year and, and just be really gorgeous. But, you know, it's one of those things that is just a really, really brilliant red that we don't see very often um, in our prairie plants. So in and amongst all of the common yellow and purple ones in there, getting this really bright red thing right in the middle of there really helps it to stand out. So. Um, yeah, cardinal flower if it's if it's in a wetter area, royal catchfly if it's in a drier area. This is another one that hummingbirds actually really like, so um, a great one to have in your yard and a great one to find, you know, just kind of stumble across out in nature. Joe Pieweed. All right, Joe Pieweed has earned the nickname of butterfly magnet, and it's well earned. Butterflies love Joe Pieweed. And it is just going nuts right now. This is another one that gets a little tall. So be careful if you're going to put it in your garden. Be careful of where you put it. Make sure it's in an area that can handle tall stuff. You know, I'm talking like six feet, seven feet tall stuff. Um, if it's really happy. But that huge cluster of flowers on the top, I'm telling you, I have seen more butterflies hanging out around Joe Pieweed. And, and butterflies and bees and all kinds of pollinators. Everybody loves the Joe Pieweed. Fun little fact, I finally learned where the name came from in researching things for this webinar. Uh, apparently there was a Native American healer who would use a tincture of this plant and his name happened to be Joe Pye. So he used it for uh, reducing fevers and things like malaria. And so somehow it got named after him. So his name was Joe Pye. So that's where the name Joe Pye weed came from. Uh, let's see. Rochelle wants to know, does sweet Joe pie weed have similar benefits to pollinators for those of us who only have shade areas to plant it in? Yes. 
sweet Joe pie weed is just as beneficial. Um, I'm not as familiar with that one because um, Joe, regular Joe pie weed will also, will, it will grow in semi-shaded areas, but if you've got total shade, yeah, that, one, that one's fine too. Um, Joe pie weed and swamp milkweed, they do look a little bit similar. Their leaves are very different. Um, swamp milkweed leaves are very long and narrow, and Joe pies are a little bit thicker, um, or you know, just wider leaf um, and, and more of that traditional, I guess, leaf shape. Um, Joe pie weed also grows much, much taller. Um, swamp milkweed really only grows about waist high. This grows, you know, six or seven feet tall. So, um, and then the flowers on them also look very different too. Milkweed flowers have there is a Asclepius as the genus, and all Asclepius have a certain flower shape. That shape of the each individual flower is very different from Joe pie weed. So um, the stem on Joe pie weed is also kind of a reddish color, whereas on swamp milkweed it's not. So hopefully that helps as you're um, trying to tell the difference between the two of them. All right, Rattlesnake Master. This is a really fun one. I just, so those of you who've been watching my webinars know I am a sucker for weird plants. Weird plants, weird caterpillars, like the weirder things are, the more I like them. Um, this is such a unique plant. There is absolutely nothing else like this here on the Illinois prairies. Um, if you look at the species name, that yucca folium literally translates to leaf like a yucca plant. We don't grow yucca plants up here generally. They're not native anyway. Um, but this guy looks just like a yucca plant. Not as, as sharp and pointy maybe as an actual yucca is, but um, yeah, the leaves just look like it. And, and check out that flower. I mean, how bizarre is that flower? They're, um, yeah, it's just, they're so cool. And this is another one the pollinators absolutely go nuts for. I mean, this is a really great time of year if you're a butterfly, right? There is just, the world is your buffet right now if you are a butterfly because there is just so much out there to eat. So um, yeah, Rattlesnake Master is just, it's such a cool, cool looking plant. Um, and the name Rattlesnake Master comes because they used it to treat rattlesnake bites back um, you know in the days of the the early Native Americans um, and the early pioneers that were out here um, of the European settlers it was used to treat rattlesnake bites I don't know what compound in there was supposed to help with it but uh, that's that's where the name comes from all right, silphiums. Okay, silphiums are also really cool. Um, and we actually have two pages of silphiums because there are several that are up and blooming right now. Silphiums as a genus are huge. They get really, really big. This is another one I don't recommend for a front yard, except in you know some, some very specific cases. If you have a, a big fence line you're looking to cover up, go for it. Um, or, you know, a big prairie installation in your yard, something like that, then go for it. But otherwise, this is not real, things in the sylphium family, with some exceptions, um, aren't always great for your yard. Uh, cup plant especially. I love cup plant because it gives me a chance to use my favorite botanical term, which is the perfoliate leaf, which means the, the stem goes right through the center of the leaf. So if we have the leaf here, the stem is right in the middle of the leaf. You can kind of see in that picture there. And what that does, that's where this common name comes from, cup plant, is because that, where the stem goes through, will actually hold on to water. And so for things that live on the prairie during those hot, dry parts of the summer, they can actually find a water source in that plant. So you'll often see all different kinds of butterflies and, and other insects using that to get water because of that little cup that's in there. But this guy can grow seven or eight feet tall. So when you have something that big growing in your yard, again, if it's not an area where it's going to be supported by lots of other plants, they can flop over and look kind of weedy. So 
but out in a prairie, out in a preserve, it looks really spectacular. This is one of those great big guys that's just, it's so imposing looking, I love it. Compass plant, the other one we have here, now the leaves of this grow close to the ground. So this is one you can kind of get away with um, a little bit more in your yard, but it will put up that stalk with all the flowers on it that are again, six or seven feet tall. So um, just be aware that that's gonna happen. Now, compass plant gets its name because those leaves will actually turn slightly to follow the sun, and they, but they grow facing north and south. So settlers apparently would use this to help them tell direction by looking at the direction um, of, of how the leaf was oriented. So it, they do that obviously to maximize sun exposure. Um, but yeah, so really cool, cool looking plant. Other sylphiums out there, prairie dock is one. This is another one that you might be able to get away with in your yard because the leaf, that leaf is huge too. It's a great big leaf that grows low to the ground and then puts up that big tall flower stalk. Um, and then rosin weed, and again, if you maybe up against a fence is good. Rosin weed's a little less tall than some of the other ones, but you know, still a very imposing figure. Um, among the other plants. Rosin weed gets its name uh, because like, honestly, most things in the sylphium family, there's a high silica content in the leaf. And so the leaves actually feel like sandpaper. Um, the first time I encountered this, somebody had it in their yard. I didn't know what it was, um, you know, because so many of these sunflower looking things look the same. And if you're not used to looking at them, that can be kind of confusing. But boy, as soon as I felt that leaf and felt how rough and sandpapery was, I said, yeah, okay, this is a sylphium. So sylphiums are, um, like I said, all, all of them have that high uh, silica content in their leaves, which gives them that, that rough sandpapery kind of feeling to them. But um, all of these plants, super cool, really tall. So beware if you're gonna put those in your yard. Bee balm, I love me some bee balm. Um, this is in the mint family. So those of you who are familiar with things in the mint family know what I'm going to say next. If you put this in your yard, be aware it's going to spread. If it's happy, it's going to go everywhere. So I have some in my yard and it has really taken over. Um, but boy, when it blooms, the, as the name would imply, bees love it. So great, great pollinator plant. Uh, wild bergamot is another common name for it. Um, I've read it's different from the bergamot they use in like Earl Grey teas. It's, it's not the same plant, but it was used to make teas. Some people apparently still use it to make teas as they do a lot of things in the mint family. Um, but I also wanted to take this chance to talk about cultivars. So a lot of the natives that we find you'll see cultivars, and that's all the pictures that we have over there on the right, all those different things. They're all cultivars of our native bee balm. When they make cultivars, they crossbreed different things, different plants that have traits that are mutations. So they find a plant that has a mutation they like, and they try to emphasize that mutation, either by having double flowers or different colors, or maybe it blooms at a different time, or, I mean, look at that one right on top there, that kind of green and purpley and yellow one there. I mean, that looks totally different from the original uh, Monarda flower. And, and, you know, they do that to be more attractive to gardeners, but also because they can um, sort of trademark that plant. Uh, it's probably not the right term, but, you know, basically they can own that cultivar and sell it at a premium. So you're paying more for it. The downside of it is a lot of times when we mess with the flowers, they become unrecognizable to the pollinators. So things like butterflies and, and bees may take a look at this and go, I, I don't know what this thing is. I don't think I can eat it. I mean, animals know when they go out what things are edible and, and, and which ones are not. And when you change them too much, you know, maybe uh, by changing the bloom time, the insect that would pollinate it 
is past that life stage or isn't yet to that life stage where it needs it. So it's blooming at the wrong time. Um, if you change the colors, insects can actually see colors that we can't see. And by changing the colors on there, now all of a sudden they have no idea what that thing is. Um, changing the flower shape. I, I say that um, you can think of an insect's mouth parts and flowers like being a lock and a key. And if you change that lock too much, the key no longer fits in it anymore. So changing up that flower may mean that insect's mouth parts can no longer maybe reach where the pollen is or the nectar is um, because the flower's too big. Or maybe it's decreased the amount of nectar that that flower produces. So if you're truly trying to have a pollinator friendly native garden, you really wanna look for the wild type of these plants. So um, the one on the left there, that is the wild type, that is the wild type color. And so that's really, that's the one you wanna look for. Obviously, if you're going for certain colors or things like that and you don't care about pollinators, then you know, by all means, pick whichever one you want. But know that a lot of times these cultivars over time end up reverting back to the wild type anyway. So just because you have one that's bright red now, three years from now, it might be back to that light purple. So that happens. Um, and Robin says several Monarda cultivars are also prone to powdery mildew. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing too, is you know, you change them. It, the reason we don't see these colors in nature is because they're not as successful. That's why it's a, a mutation and not the wild type. You know, nature has had many, many cycles to go through what's gonna work the best. And that ends up being the wild type. It's the things that are different. It, it, there's some reason they're not as successful out in the wild. And that's why we don't see them usually. All right, obedient plant. Obedient plant is a really fun little guy. Um, this is another one that there's a lot of cultivars out there. So kind of beware, but the wild type does have some variation in it, anywhere from the white to the light purple. So um, you might see these. Now, you might be thinking, obedient plant. Well, how is a plant obedient? Where does that name come from? Well, if you see how the flowers are all arranged on that spike, in obedient plant, you can take each of those little flowers and sort of move them around that center spike and they'll stay where you put them. It's a really fun thing to show kids, you know, it, and it's just fun moving the flowers every which way on that stem and just kind of funny. But uh, anyway, so that's where it gets its name from. You know, us uh, botanists, we got to find fun where we can. So, um, but this is another really great one for uh, pollinators. You can see in that picture on the right there, that little bee butt sticking his way out of there. You know, bees just love sticking their heads in these flowers. Um, they're really fun. But this, this is a really nice one to have in your yard as well. All right, wild quinine. So the name from wild quinine comes from the fact that um, they've actually, during World War I, they used this when supplies of actual quinine uh, ran low and they needed something else instead. So they found this one was actually apparently a good substitute for the other type of quinine that they would usually use to treat things like malaria. Um, so this one, it looks, the flower, I, I feel like the flower really resembles yarrow. And, you know, I said I hear yarrow's not blooming, but I, I checked my books. My yarrow in my yard is all bloomed out already. Um, but according to the books, apparently other types of yarrow are still blooming. So um, that may not be entirely correct there, um, but that's what my plant book said. Um, but like I said, what I see in my yard, my yarrow is all done. So that could just be the type that I have or where I have it in my yard, I don't know. But yeah, wild quinine, it, it, it's a really nice, it's that very delicate little flower. Um, another difference between quinine and yarrow is you notice how lacy the leaves are in yarrow. And in wild quinine, they're not. It's just that, that full um, toothed kind of leaf as opposed to yarrow, which just the leaf on it just looks really delicate and lacy. Um, I love yarrow because of that. I love having it in my yard. It makes for a really nice texture in amongst all the other plants, just that very light lacy look on the leaf. Um, but uh, wild quinine is also a very lovely little plant to have in your, your yard, or you may come across it in a preserve. 
All right, coreopsis. So I have listed out a couple of different types of coreopsis here. Note there are many more. Um, coreopsis are blooming now. They're basically like that yellow flower, as long as it's not something huge and tall, because then we know it's a sylphium. But if it's kind of a short blooming yellow disc type flower, it's probably a coreopsis. Um, you know, different colors. There's tall coreopsis, gets kind of big. Um, they have other names like tick seed is another one they call it too but lots of different types of coreopsis these make nice uh, bushy installments of of these bright yellow flowers they really add a lot of color to um, a, a flower bed a prairie whatever lots of really great uh, great color from these these coreopsis so we talk a lot about native plants and again those of you who have been in my webinars before know that's pretty much what we talk about are native plants and why are we so hung up on native plants well for one it will save you time and money in the long run because these plants come back year after year after year after year you're not constantly having to buy annuals to plant um, you're not having to uh, water them constantly and fertilize them and sort of trick them into thinking it's wherever they're native to. Um, so, and, and you know, they, they will fill in an area. You can buy a smaller number of them and they will fill in. So they save you time and money. But also, when you have this, now you have this. So those caterpillars eat the native plants and it's okay. Studies have shown that native insects, notice I said native insects, we're not talking about Japanese beetles or um, emerald ash borer, things like that. We're not talking about the invasive stuff, but native insects will do about 20% damage to a plant. Studies have shown that most people feel that they need to start treating a plant around 50% damage. So they'll do a little bit of damage, but we're okay with that because that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to feed um, our pollinators, whether it's the adult forms with the pollen and the nectar or their younger caterpillar forms um, with the leaves and all of that. So we bring in the caterpillars. So now we've got the caterpillars and the butterflies, but now we're bringing in the birds too because birds eat the caterpillars. And those caterpillars are like, they're like chicken nuggets for their babies, right? They're nutrient dense, they're soft. You know, if you ever watch a, a parent bird feeding the young, they just, it's so violent looking. They just sort of cram that thing down the baby bird's throat. And so caterpillars are nice and soft bodied, super nutrient dense. I've heard that it's more dense than beef. There's more nutrients in them than in beef. So it's, you know, super nutrient dense, great food for their young. So we bring the native plants in, that brings the insects in, the insects bring the birds, the birds then bring other birds in too. And you know, while we don't like to think about our songbirds and all that being eaten, everybody's got to eat. And boy, I'll tell you, I just love seeing the hawks around my yard. It's, it's so cool to watch them fly and to see the power in them. They're so cool. And so now, instead of your yard being apart from the ecosystem, you're a part of the ecosystem you're helping all of these native things who have been displaced because of building and you know the new target that was put up and whatever um, you're you're helping to give them space and give them food give them shelter what they need so if you are going to bring some of these plants into your yard there's a few things to think of what is the area like that you're planting in is it full sun full shade or is it somewhere in between is it wet or dry, or maybe it's music? Music is a term you're gonna see um, when they talk about plants. It just, it's that Goldilocks thing. It's that, it's not too wet, not too dry. It's sort of right in the middle there. Um, are there trees that are gonna cast shade as they grow up? Um, we, my story I tell kind of on myself now is we have a berm on the side of our house that when we moved in, it had like three half dead pine trees in it. And that was pretty much it. Um, so we took out the half dead pine trees and we put a couple of other small trees in place, but you know, this berm's now in full shade or full sun. So 
planted lots of sun loving things. Well, we've now been here almost 15 years and the trees have grown up and I planted a bunch of things even as early as the spring. We make these mistakes too. Um, because I have it in my head that this berm is full sun. And I realized as I'm planting, wow, there's actually a lot of shade here. So, you know, learn from my mistakes, spend some time in the area you're looking to plant at different times of the day. You know, go out there in the early morning, go out there midday, go out there in the evening and see what is the sun like in this area. And, you know, it may not be as sunny as you think it is. So, we have, as part of the Conservation Foundation, our Conservation at Home program. This is a program where we do consultations with homeowners to talk about how you can bring these native plants to your yard. So we come out to your yard, we'll walk around with you, we can make recommendations about different plants where you can plant them, different things you can do with your yard, like say a rain garden, for example, or a butterfly garden, and just talk about how you can uh, make your yard more habitat friendly. And this goes for those of you who are within our service area of Kane, Kendall, DuPage, and Will counties. But if you're outside of our area, we do have a few uh, franchisees like that do our conservation at home program. So you can see here, um, these are the folks to contact if you are outside of our area. If you're not in any of those areas, go, you can check out findalandtrust.org. That will show you where your closest land trust is. And even though they may not be a member or they might not be one of our franchisees, many times they are still happy to give you ideas or assist you with native plants and things like that coming to your area. Uh, let's see. Charlene wants to know, should I remove all the existing grass, dandelions, etc., before I plant native plants? Yes. Um, you don't wanna try planting in existing grass because the grass will outcompete it. So you definitely, the recommendation is definitely remove all that. Um, we did do a webinar with my friend, Eric Anderson on converting lawn into pollinator garden. So check out our YouTube channel where we go into a little more detail on how to do that. But yeah, definitely you, you do need to remove that first before you bring in your native stuff. You'll have a lot more success that way. Um, and Charlene says, I have a clump of Coreopsis that was doing really well next to my rain garden. After we had a drought for weeks, followed by very heavy rain, the plant just completely died. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes that happens. It's hard to say what exactly the problem was. A lot would depend on the type of Coreopsis it was. Maybe it just wasn't in a great spot to begin with. The plant could have been stressed. Um, something could have eaten the roots. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's hard to say, but yeah, unfortunately that happens and sometimes we just have to, um, you can try again, or if, um, you know, you try again and the plant dies again, well, maybe that wasn't the best spot for that plant. So, you know, every, everything has a place where it's happy and, and probably a lot of places where it's not. Some things are easier to grow than others. Um, I've done so many experiments on this little berm at the side of my house. I, I can't even count the number of things I had there, you know, um, cone flowers. There's one spot in that berm that can grow cone flowers and they've died everywhere else I've put them or haven't come back since they are, are um, annuals. But um, yeah, that, you know, it's just, unfortunately, that's how it goes sometimes. It's, it's trial and error. Sometimes it's the soil there's something, maybe the soil is too acidic or the soil um, is too basic. Too much water, not enough water, who knows? You know, there, there are so many things that, that can happen and it's, it's just trial and error. Um, I always jokingly refer to what I do as cage match gardening. I buy two or three of different things that I like. I throw them in an area and whoever survives can stay. So, um, is it the best way to garden? No, probably not. Um, it's also not the most artistic way, but as I've mentioned in previous webinars, I'm also not the most artistic person out there. So, um, you know, I throw plants in and, and if you survive, yay, I'll probably buy a few more and throw those in there too. So um, just kind of how it goes. 
If you are interested in more ways to get involved with the Conservation Foundation, you can become a member. As I mentioned before, at the end of the webinar, you're taken to our resources page. And on that resources page is our virtual tip jar, and it does have a checkbox on there. I think I was told to um, become a member. So you can choose to become a member or just make a one-time donation, whatever you'd like to do. Um, you can also visit our McDonald Farm in Naperville or the Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery. Our McDonald Farm is an actual working farm. So it's a 60 acre farm in Naperville and 49 of those acres are, are organically farmed. Um, and we have a CSA type program uh, that feeds over 500 families. So you buy a share of the produce and you can come every week or every other week and pick up a selection of fresh vegetables grown right there. We are sold out this year. This is the first year that has happened. It was insane. Uh, but apparently with COVID, everybody wants to know where their food's coming from. So um, if you are interested, I think they open up shares for purchase again, like towards the end of the year for the following year. So you can always do that. Um, or you can just come and visit. We have a children's garden. We have a wild edibles garden. Uh, we have restored prairie, uh, restored stream habitat. Um, it's, it's really a cool way to come out and walk around. So it is private property. We're, we aren't really open to the public, but we don't mind if people wanna come walk around and check things out. As long as you stay out of the farmer's way, it's fine. Uh, and then our Dixon Merced Farm in Montgomery is more of a historic farm. So some farm buildings there, normally they would have um, lots of events and things going on there throughout the year. But um, so I'm not sure what all they'll be able to do this year, but it, it's a pretty cool place. So, um, and you follow us on social media by all means, uh, Facebook, Insta, all of that. Uh, Facebook, you'll see all of the upcoming webinars on there as well. So um, if you want to check out future webinars, that's the place to go. Uh, and then you can get certified, you know, drop us a line and we will get you certified um, or we will help you get certified in your yard. So we we'll turn a few questions along the way, but if anybody's got any other questions, I am happy to answer those as well. Um, let me open up the chat box here again. So um, thank you to those of you who dropped in today. Um, as always, I do appreciate this attendance. I'm always blown away by how many people want to uh, listen to me ramble on about plants or birds or bugs or whatever I feel like talking about. Um, so let's see, take a look if there's any questions. Um, but um, again, let's see. Oh, you guys are so welcome. Thank you for the thank yous. It does, it, it, it really does warm my heart to see all the interest that everybody has and to um, see everybody who is interested to in um, learning more about our native plants. Um, Bonnie, yes, all of our webinars are recorded. I will upload it to YouTube later on today. So definitely check out our YouTube channel um, for more for this webinar as well as others. Um, and Susan, uh, flowers for part shade, boy, there's a ton of them. So um, I actually did, uh, on our YouTube channel, we have a whole webinar for planting in shade and wet areas. So rather than going into a ton of those right now, um, I will suggest you check that one out because there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's some really great part shade um, plants in there aside from poison ivy because poison ivy loves part shade. Um, so there is that as well. So. Um, Oh, Mississippi. I think you might be the first Mississippi person. So you're very welcome, Mississippi. Um, so with that, again, thank you everyone. And I'm going to wrap it up for today. But if you have any questions, if it, you know you think of something later, please feel free to drop me uh, an email. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And I hope to see you all again next week. Remember, uh, we are going to Wednesdays now for the future. 
Um, so next Wednesday, I get to go on about butterflies. As you can see, I'm a big butterfly fan. So um, I get to geek out on monarch butterflies. So that'll be fun. So thanks again. And everybody stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.